everybody listening in. We again are on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And today, we are moving into our third declaration of freedom, which is freedom from discouragement, no frustration. And that's found in Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. And today I'll read those verses from the God's Word translation. Starting with verse 18. I consider our present suffering insignificant compared to the glory that will soon be revealed to us. All creation is eagerly waiting for God to reveal his, who his children are. Creation was subjected to frustration, but not not by its own choice. The one who subjected it to frustration did so in the hope that it would also be set free from slavery to decay in order to share the glorious freedom that the children of God will have. We know that all creation has been groaning with the pain of childbirth, up to the present time. However, not only creation groans, we who have the Spirit as the first of God's gifts also groan inwardly. We groan as we eagerly wait for our adoption, the freeing of our bodies from sin. We were saved with this hope in mind. If we hope for something we already see, it's not really hope. Who hopes for what can be seen? But if we hope for what we don't see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. At the same time, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we don't know how to pray for what we need. But the Spirit intercedes along with our groans that cannot be expressed in words. The one who searches our hearts knows what the Spirit has in mind. The Spirit intercedes for God's people the way God wants him to. Verse 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those whom he has called according to his plan. This is true because he already knew his people and had already appointed them to have the same form as the image of his son. Therefore, his son is the firstborn among many children. He also called those who he had already appointed. He approved of those whom he had called and gave glory to those whom he had approved. So, Here in our verses, Paul ends uh, verse 17 by saying, If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Which gives him a transition into verses 18 through 30, which speaks about suffering and groaning, which are at least two of the things in life that we all wish we could just skip over. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to groan. But suffering 
it is a real problem that we must deal with. Adam's disobedience brought death and suffering into the world. And it is it is it, it will be here until Jesus returns. The thing about sin is that it's not just an individual thing, but it's also a universal thing. We, like the people in Jesus' day, are guilty of attributing a person's suffering to some sin that they have committed. Sometimes that might be the case, but other times it's because of universal sin. We live in a sinful, fallen world. And because of that, stuff just happens, even to good people. We can't escape it. Sometimes, as Christians, we are guilty of, of taking a, a Pollyanna approach. Uh, Pollyanna is an excessively cheerful or optimistic person. Uh, Pollyanna's cheerfulness or, or her cheerful personality serves as a way, uh, as a kind of a, a security blanket, a way to comfort and buffet her against the winds of life disappointments. And we all know people that no matter what the situation, they have a pie in the sky mentality. Uh, they would much rather tell themselves and believe the most desirable outcome. And even though they would like to believe that even though the likelihood of it happening is slim to none. Those of you who know me know that Google and me are besties. I will Google anything. Sometimes I Google for information and sometimes I Google just to see if I can come up with something that Google won't have. As of yet, Google always wins. They, they have everything. I, I was doing some Googling on uh, discouragement and suffering and pain and just kind of going in that direction and ran across an article on an innovation and creative web page that caught my attention. The article was titled, The Stockdale Paradox how to prevail in times of crisis. And I thought it was an excellent article. And I'll just read an excerpt from the article. It starts with the Stockdale Paradox by James Stockdale, which says, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the, dis with the discipline to comfort women with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. And then the article starts. The article starts, uh, I couldn't figure out who was writing the article, so we're just going to have to go with it. Uh, the article starts with, it was late fall in 2009, and I had gone out to the, to the Buck Creek field for a walk. Everything in my life was a swirly, unrecognizable mess. I walked round and round the track, talking loud to myself, trying to come up with the idea for how to best proceed. As I passed the metal bleachers, it hit me, a passage I read in a book many years prior that had resonated so powerfully with me. It made my hair stand on, on end. I knew the book held important clues. I ran home. I burst through the front door, scanned the books for the bright red spine, and located Jim Collins' Good to Great. I searched the index for the Stockdale Paradox and found the message. Collins told the story of Admiral James Stockdale, who was a POW during the Vietnam War. Collins notes, it just seemed so bleak, the uncertainty of his fate, the brutality of his captors, and so forth. How on earth did he deal with it? When Collins asked that question directly to Stockdale, he replied, I never, I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining events of my life, which in retrospect, 
I would not trade. Collins followed with another question. Who didn't make it out? The optimists. Oh, they were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and Christmas would go. Then they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving. And then it would be Christmas again. And they died of a broken heart. This is an important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. I closed the book with a slam, grabbed a legal pad and pen, and mapped out each and every brutal fact of my current situation. I got every terrifying detail down in black and white. When I stopped, took a breath, and read over my notes, I had three pages of blurts interwined, seemingly impossible to overcome, no great choices. But it was now out of my head and all stepped, and it, and all stepped out in front of me. It was a good start. Oddly, once I saw the scope of my challenges in their eternity, all in one place, I got a whiff of possibilities for the first time in months. It had taken courage to face reality, extricate, my, extricate myself from the quicksand of denial and let the veil drop. Now standing naked and exposed, I could move into problem solving mode. So. Suffering is a very real part of life and no amount of positive thinking is going to make it not be so. It's not going to make it go away. Jesus told the disciples, in the world you, have, you shall have tribulations, but be of good courage. I have overcome the world. We all like to read about the three Hebrews that were thrown into the fiery furnace and how they were walking around with Jesus in, in one of his pre-incarnated appearances in the Old Testament. We, we like to read about Daniel in the lion den and we like to imagine that the lion, uh, the lion being a pillow for David's head to rest on. Hebrews, the 11th chapter is our Hall of Faith chapter. And we're inspired when we read verses one through uh, the first part of verse 35. It, it, it gives us a sense of hope that God is going to deliver me from whatever circumstances that I might be in. Whether it be as a result of my own sin or whether it's because I live in a fallen world, we like to believe that God is going to deliver me. And that's good. I, I say hope, hold out hope until the end. Don't give up hope. Hope, hold on to your faith. Hold on to the faith. But don't do it at the expense of not confronting the sometimes brutal reality of your situation. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, after reading about all of the folk that uh, by faith was delivered, starting with the latter part of verse 35, things take a turn. It, it says, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain their better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others were chained and put in, in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed into. They were put to death by the sword. They were about, they went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and, and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us 
would they be made perfect. So think about it. These folk were just as faithful as the ones in the first part of the chapter. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Verse 38 says that the world was not worthy of them. That tells me that not everybody gets delivered on this side. Their faith remains intact, yet, their face, yet they face the brutal fact that they live in a fallen world. And sometimes even good people suffer as a result. You ever wonder why Jesus, while he was on the earth, didn't go after the, the politics of that time? Uh, they, they were just as crooked then as they are now. And yet Jesus didn't start a revolution. He didn't try to overthrow the government. He addressed them, of course, when they needed, when the need arose, but only as it related to the kingdom of God and who he was. If you're waiting for me to give you an answer, don't wait. I don't have an answer. I don't know. Faith means that I won't always have an answer. And that's okay, because I am kept by God, who promises to never leave nor forsake me. My youngest grandson usually spends a month, yeah, a whole month, out of the summer with us. Last year, while he was here, our alarm system, we were having problems with it, and for whatever reason, it was malfunctioning. And so one night, in the wee hours of the morning, the thing went off. And if you've ever been awoken by a, a, from a deep sleep by an alarm, you know how it feels to be startled by that very loud noise. And my husband and I, we both jumped like straight up out of the bed. And after coming to our senses, went to check the house out and, and turn, turn the thing off to make it quit alarming. And, and then uh, my husband checked on my grandson in, his gran in my grandson's room. And to our amazement, he was sound asleep. All that noise, he was sound asleep. So the next morning, my husband asked my grandson, who was about seven or eight at the time, he said, did you hear that noise last night? And my grandson goes, yeah, I heard it. But I knew you would take care of it. So I went back to sleep. Paul tells us in the 8th chapter of Romans that we can have that kind of freedom to sleep through a loud noise, sleep through an alarming noise, sleep through whatever situation that we're going through. We can have freedom, uh, freedom from judgment, which means no condemnation. We can have freedom from defeat which means that I am only obligated to Jesus and we can have freedom from discouragement, which means no frustration, even in wake of today's time. Note, he does not tell us that we won't suffer or have pain or that we will be free from life's disappointments, but he's telling us, but, but, we don't have to let those things take up space in our heads, in our minds, or in our hearts. As Jesse Jackson used to say, keep hope alive. Acknowledge the fact that, that it's a part of life. Acknowledge the fact that in this life, everybody suffers, even believers. The difference is that believers don't or shouldn't suffer in the same fashion as non-believers. The word suffer here means all the forms of suffering which the believer experiences throughout life. It means the suffering that comes from persecution, the suffering that comes from the struggle of our spirit as we work to overcome the flesh and the world. It is the weight and the agony of fighting to overcome sin and corruption, disease and pain, uh, to overcome abuse and persecution, 
to overcome unrestrained urges and desires. It is the weight and the agony of fighting to overcome our own weaknesses and shortcomings, even also aging and loss as, as well as deterioration and decay. All those things are real and we cannot wish them away and we cannot pray them away. Paul says, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's a bold statement that was written over 2,000 years ago, but it could be the headlines of any newspaper or any breaking news for, for any news show as current as today. The main story is that it is that thing that will capture the most attention. It, is the, it, 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 it will be placed in the most prominent position and contain a large, bold-faced headline. On the news, the main thing, it, it, it's, it's that thing that separates it from other news. So they, what they do on the news is stated as breaking news. Can't you see it? Breaking news, a bold headline, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Can't you hear it? The newspaper boy of old, heralding on the streets, extra, extra, read all about it. Our current suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. I hear it. Can't you hear it? But I also hear an ever so faint voice in the background saying, to be continued, to be continued. Oh, well, until next time, be blessed. Let us pray. Father, we said thank you. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for letting us know that our current suffering is nothing compared to what you have in store for us. Father, we, we pray that our hearts will be uplifted, that our hope will be renewed in, in this knowing that, that you have something better for us. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.